Hi, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 11. In this lecture, we'll discuss speed and velocity. This topic is covered in Chapter 4 of our textbook by Survey and Jouett. Up until now, we've been using the words speed and velocity synonymously. As it turns out, there is a distinction between speed and velocity. And so over the next few slides, we want to develop a more precise definition of velocity and clearly explain what the distinction between speed and velocity is. To begin with, velocity is the rate of change in position. Mathematically, that means that velocity is the derivative of position with respect to time. However, when discussing motion in two or three dimensions, you have to remember that position itself can be two or three distinct numbers. In two dimensions, the position vector refers to an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, and each of those coordinates can independently depend on time. So when we're taking the derivative of a vector, what we really have to do is take the derivative of two quantities. In a sense, we're distributing the derivative into the vector, we're taking the derivative of the x component and separately taking the derivative of the y component. And that gives us the two components of velocity. So when we speak of velocity, we're really talking about two numbers, at least in two dimensions. Those two numbers are the x coordinate and the y coordinate. And each one of those at any given time can be positive or negative or zero. Speed, on the other hand, is the magnitude of the velocity vector. So this is the precise definition of speed. Once you have the two components of the velocity vector, you square each one, you add them together, you take the square root, and that gives you speed. So speed is really the length or the magnitude of the velocity vector. Speed is always a single positive number, and it makes no reference to the direction. So when you're driving your car, you might say, my speed is 60 miles per hour. That speed does not at all indicate whether you're heading north or east or west or south. If you want to know the heading, if you want to know the direction of the car, you need to specify the velocity. So going forward, we're going to obey this distinction uh, much more strictly. When we talk about speed, we're always talking about a positive number. And if we want to talk about direction, then we're going to talk about velocity and its components, v sub x and v sub y. Another important fact about velocity is that an object's velocity vector is always tangent to the path followed by the object. So if you know the path that the object is following, figuring out the direction of the velocity is easy you always draw it as a tangent vector to the path. If you have an airplane, for example, and you know that it's following a path described by this uh, dashed line here, then you should know that the velocity of the airplane, at least at this moment, is going to point along that dashed path. You may not know the magnitude or the length of this vector, so you may not know the speed of the airplane, but the direction of the airplane is indicated by the velocity vector, which always points along the path. Now for a straight path, this is really a rather trivial and easy to understand concept. It becomes a little bit less trivial when you discuss more complicated paths. For example, the path of uh, Earth around the sun is an elliptical path. So the Earth follows an elliptical path as it orbits uh, the sun once every year, and if you want to know what the Earth's velocity is at a particular point, you need to draw a tangent line. So at this point in its orbit, we have drawn a tangent line. And remember, a tangent touches a curve at exactly one point. And then we can draw the velocity vector as being along or parallel to that tangent line. We may not know the speed of Earth at this moment, but its direction will be along that tangent line. A little bit later, when the Earth is at this point in its orbit, we can again draw a tangent line, a straight line that touches the curve at exactly one point, and then we can say that the velocity vector is in that direction. We would have to know a little more physics to figure out the speed, but the direction is relatively straightforward once you know the path that is being followed. Here's a slightly more complicated situation 
We have a hill uh, with a complicated profile. We have a car that is driving up and down this hill. We may not know the speed of the car. For that, we would have to look at its speedometer. But the direction of the velocity vector at each point is easy to figure out. If you want to know which way the velocity vector points here, you would draw a tangent line to the path being followed. In this particular example, this dashed black line indicates the path that is being followed. And the dashed orange line indicates the tangent to the path. And then the velocity vector is simply parallel or along the tangent line. We don't know the magnitude or the length of this vector, so we don't know the speed of the car, but at least the direction is easy to figure out. It's always along the tangent to the path that the car is following. That path here is being dictated by the profile of the hill on which um, the car is driving. The velocity of an object may change, and that results in acceleration. Remember that acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. We've already talked about acceleration before, but here I want to emphasize that velocity and acceleration do not have to point in the same direction. In fact, often they point in opposite directions depending on what the object is doing. So let's consider a few different scenarios. Consider a car that is moving in the positive direction. So imagine a car that is moving to the right, let's say, and it is speeding up. So if you were to look at the speedometer of this car, you would see that the needle is rising, going from 10 to 20 to 30 to 40 miles per hour. If I asked you to draw a velocity vector for this car, you would draw something like this because the car is moving to the right. Uh, its path would seem simply be a straight horizontal path, so the velocity vector would point in this direction. If I asked you to draw an acceleration vector, you would draw something like this, again pointing to the right. The problem doesn't give us enough information to figure out the magnitudes of these vectors, but here I just want to focus on the directions. You could say that v sub x, as in the x component of the velocity vector, is a positive number, and the x component of the acceleration vector is also a positive. This makes sense. We have a car that is moving to the right and it is speeding up. Here's a different scenario. We have a car that is moving in the positive direction just as before, but this time it's slowing down. So the driver is applying the brakes and the car is slowing down. What can we say about the velocity vector and the acceleration vector in this case? Well, the velocity vector again points to the right because the car is moving to the right. However, the acceleration vector now points to the left. The car is slowing down. Its velocity vector is getting shorter and shorter, so its speed is decreasing. So we would say that the acceleration vector must point in the negative direction. Again, we don't have numbers here, but we could say that the x component of velocity is a positive number while the x component of acceleration is a negative number. This situation is sometimes described as deceleration, although it's more common to simply say the acceleration is negative. Notice in this case, the velocity vector and the acceleration vector are pointing in opposite directions because the acceleration vector tells us how the velocity vector is changing. In this case, the velocity vector is getting shorter and shorter. Here's a third scenario. This time the car is moving in the negative direction, so the car is moving to the left, let's say, and it is speeding up. So this car is accelerating, but it is accelerating to the left. In this case, we would draw the velocity vector pointing to the left because the object is moving to the left, and this vector should be getting longer and longer every second because the car is speeding up. Remember, speed refers to the magnitude of this vector independent of its direction. So the acceleration vector would also point to the left. We could say that the x component of velocity is a negative number, indicating that the car is moving in the negative direction. And we could say that the acceleration has an x component that is also negative. Here's one final scenario. The car is moving in the negative direction and it is slowing down. So the car is moving to the left, but the driver is applying the brakes. 
Well, if the car is moving to the left, the velocity vector would be drawn to the left. But since the car is slowing down, since it is decelerating, we would draw the acceleration vector to the right, indicating that this vector here, the velocity vector, is going to get shorter and shorter and shorter. Its speed is going to be decreasing. So we can say that the x component of velocity is negative and the x component of acceleration is positive. These four examples require a little bit of thinking to get straight, but notice that acceleration and velocity do not have to point in the same direction. Often they point in opposite directions, depending on how the speed is changing relative to the direction of motion. Let's do a practice problem. The car drives with a constant speed of 10 meters per second on a circular track of radius 159 meters approximately. Calculate the average acceleration of the car as it moves from zero to 90 degrees. So we have a circular track, which means that the path that the car is following is a circle. Um, and the car initially starts at zero degrees relative to the positive x-axis. And then a few seconds later, we don't exactly know when, but eventually it ends up at this point at 90 degrees relative to the x-axis. The speed of the car is constant during this period of time, but its velocity is not constant. So we want to know how the velocity is changing, or more precisely, we want to know the average acceleration of the car. Remember how average acceleration is defined. Average acceleration refers to the change in velocity. More precisely, it's delta V divided by delta T. And of course, delta V is V final minus V initial. So we need to figure out what the initial velocity and the final velocity of the car are, and then take the difference to figure out delta V to calculate the average acceleration. We know what the speed of the car is, and remember that the speed tells us what the magnitude of the velocity vector is. To figure out the direction of the velocity vector, we remember that the velocity vector is always tangent to the path being followed. If the path is circular, we can say initially the velocity vector must point in this direction. Notice the velocity vector is drawn tangent to the circle. And the magnitude or the length of this arrow is 10. That's the information that's given to us in the problem. The final velocity vector is going to also be tangent to the circle. So once again, we draw a tangent line to the circle. Here, as indicated in the picture, the car is traveling in the counterclockwise direction. So we would draw the velocity vector like this. These two velocity vectors have the same magnitude, so the length of these um, two arrows are equal at 10 meters per second, but clearly their directions are different. And therefore we can say that the velocity vector is changing, and therefore there must be some acceleration. To do the calculations, we need to have the x and y components of each one of these vectors. Looking at the initial velocity vector, we see that this vector points only in the y direction, not in the x direction. More precisely, to get from the tail to the tip of this arrow, I would move zero units in the x direction and 10 units in the y direction. Remember that the length of this arrow is 10 meters per second. That's the speed of the car. So we can say that the x and y components of the initial velocity vector are 0, 10. Looking at the velocity vector, finally, we see that to get from the tail to its tip, we would have to move 10 units in the negative x direction and no units in the y direction. So the components of v final are minus 10, 0. We're interested in the change in the velocity vector. Remember, to calculate the change in velocity, we need to take the difference of these two vectors. To subtract two vectors, we use component-wise subtraction, which means we'll subtract 0 from minus 10, and we'll subtract 10 from 0, and that gives us delta v, which is minus 10, comma minus 10. Now, to calculate the acceleration, we also need to know time. We need to know how long it takes for the car to actually get from point A to point B. That information is not really given in the problem, but we can figure it out. 
we know that um, the radius of this track is given to us as approximately 159. That allows us to figure out the circumference or the distance around the track. Of course, the car is not traveling the full circumference of the track, it's traveling one fourth or a quarter of the circumference. And that allows us to figure out the distance that the car is traveling. Since we know the speed, we should be able to take the distance divided by speed and get the time. More precisely, we can calculate the circumference of the track. The circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. Plugging in the radius, we find that this track is exactly 1,000 meters around. The distance that is traveled by the car is actually one-fourth of that distance, so the car is traveling 250 meters. It's traveling this distance with a constant speed of 10 meters per second. Since the speed is constant, I can simply take the distance and divide it by the speed. So delta T ends up being 250 meters divided by 10 meters per second, which gives me 25 seconds. So it takes the car 25 seconds to travel from its initial location to its final location. We can now calculate the average velocity. Average velocity is delta V over delta T. We know delta V is minus 10 comma minus 10, and we need to divide this vector by the time, which is 25 seconds. Dividing by 25 is the same thing as multiplying by one over 25. So we're going to take one over 25 and we're going to distribute that into the vector. This is how we multiply a vector by a scalar. We multiply the X component and then we multiply the Y component. And what we find is that the average acceleration vector is minus 0 0.4 comma minus 0 0.4. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.